Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. During this episode, I'm going to be speaking with the legendary Randy Jackson. Let's hear the applause, everybody. Randy has toured with the iconic rock band Journey, Don't Stop Believin', produced some of the most successful records in music history, written best-selling books, and starred as one of the original judges of the TV hit show American Idol. In fact, we all know a very famous American Idol winner, Kelly Clarkson, who used my book, The Plant Paradox, to fix her autoimmune issue and lose weight. But back to my guest, Randy Jackson. After years of being overweight, Randy considers getting healthy to be one of his biggest accomplishments to date. And now he's paying it forward by helping others do the same. So today, Randy and I are gonna discuss his amazing journey to health. We'll also show you how you can transform your health by making better choices every day. So Randy, welcome to the program, and I really commend you for taking charge of your health. Dr. Gundry, thank you so much, man. Listen, I'm a huge fan. I know Kelly's a huge fan. Uh, I've been following you for a long time. I'm so happy to be doing your podcast. I'm a big fan. Well, thanks so much. Uh, now, like me, you struggled with your weight for years. Now, what, why did you think this was such an issue for you? Did it have anything to do with the way you were raised? I think it had to do a lot with the way I was raised. And, you know, I was in sports all my life until I graduated college. And, you know, I just wasn't working out anymore. I, you know, had a very sedentary lifestyle. And, you know, I grew up living a good eating life in Louisiana. Everything's fried. Everything's with a ton of sugar, a ton of butter. Everything is everything, as they like to say. And when you have a sedentary lifestyle, it just pounds on you. Then that problem compounds because you get heavier and you don't want to run. I used to always see people running on the street. And I would say to my friend, yeah, those are the skinny people. It's easier for them to run. They don't have to carry around this extra 150 pounds. So, you know, it was a, a different thing for me. So... Uh, I arrived at uh, 358 and had to make some changes. Yeah, and you know, what was it like for you? I mean, being on television every single week and you know, your, your weight issues were obviously obvious. What was that like? You know, it was really tough because I had low energy. It was hard to move around, get around. I got tired often. And what really, really happened to me is I felt like I was sick. I had the flu couldn't quench my thirst. I felt very lethargic for a long time. I finally go to my doctor and I said, well, look, let's run some tests. Um, I was there the next day, but that night I was feeling terribly bad and I wound up in the emergency room. Uh, the doctor gave me one test and came back that I developed type 2 diabetes. So blood sugar was over 500. I had to make some serious, serious changes. So was that the wake up call or could did you know this was coming but you just kind of said ah eh, you know <laughs> you know i knew something was coming and as i always say we as men and a lot of other people especially men know we hate going to the doctor we procrastinate we put it off you know something's going to happen from living this bad life eating like a like a racehorse and not working out just driving yourself to all ends, you know something bad's bound to happen. So, and it did for me. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I saw, I saw a patient yesterday, a new patient, who um, has all the markers, a young man um, has all the markers for type 2 diabetes with high insulin levels and high blood sugar and high hemoglobin A1C. And I'm, you know, explaining this to him. And he says, well, how do I know that, you know, this is a bad thing? How do I know that, you know, bad things are going to happen to me? Uh, and I, you know, give him some of the statistics. And he says, well, yeah, but, you know, that's probably not going to happen to me. So I lean into him and I said, so you just have to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? And uh, luckily, Clint Eastwood came through for me and uh, it worked. <laughs> and I think that's a great point you bring up. I think most of us men uh, basically say, hey, I, that's not going to happen to me. I'm the lucky one. You know, also, doctors, funny we're talking about this because 
one of the reasons that being a celebrity, I wanted to voice my whole health concerns and everything is because exactly that. You think it's going to happen to somebody else. It's never going to happen to somebody like me because people have this notion that all the stars have everything all checked. All the boxes are cool. You're the most beautiful. You and I are very beautiful, Dr. Gundry. <laughs> but, you know, we have everything, and then we get this incurable disease. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. That's part of the reason, because people think that it doesn't happen to the stars. Yeah, uh, you're so right. And it, you, uh, I, I take care of, of a lot of stars, and most of them, you know, I, I never say a word about. Uh, but I'll give you a, a quick Just the names here. Tell us some names on the podcast. That, here. That's right. No, I won't mention names, but I will tell you a, a, a story that really goes along with this. So I, I see a star who's a character actor. Uh, he's his character actor is a, a fairly pudgy individual. And for years I've been seeing him now for oh, six, seven years. And he has uh, type two diabetes with high insulin levels. And he keeps telling me, look, my, you know, my career depends on me being this kind of fat, lovable guy. And I said, but you don't understand. You know, bad things are going to happen with this. I said, right. your chance of getting cancer is so much higher than, you know, a normal person. And every, I see him twice a year, and every year, um, say the same thing, last year, uh, he calls me out of the blue and he says, I just got diagnosed with prostate cancer. What do you think about that? And I said, what do you mean what do I think about it? I told you, you know, that this was going to get you and, and here it is. He says, yeah, you're right. You've been telling me that. Now what do I do? So it's, you're right. We, we assume that we're going to be the lucky one. And thank you for speaking out uh, that you can have the most talent in the world, you can be the greatest star in the world, you can be so good looking and have the best pair of glasses like you do. And, uh, like you do. <laughs> and it's, it's still gonna happen if you don't pay attention. Yeah, that's, that's the real truth about it, you know. And by the way, I always say it could happen to anyone. And there's so many bad things that could come with type two diabetes. And listen, type two diabetes, I have that, but it's not the only problem. You could develop a series of other problems, as you well know. You bet. That's just the kind of the tip of the iceberg. Okay, so back to you taking charge of your life. Now, you decided to undergo gastric bypass surgery. And believe it or not, in, back in my older days, I used to do gastric bypass surgery. So that's a, that's a big deal. It's gotten certainly better in, in years. But what, what made you decide to take this leap and you know, undergo the surgery? Because I needed something to really like wake me up and almost shock me into the reality of what was ahead of me. So, uh, you know, because I think you try the medications, you try the oral, you try whatever. So I say to my doctor, what's going to help? He says, what I've been telling you for 10 years, lose some weight. <laughs> it's going to be easier to manage your type 2 diabetes. Um, and I looked at alternatives. My mother-in-law had had the procedure done some years before. She looked amazing. She turned her health around. Because, you know, when you're lighter, you want to work out. You just can't wait to jump up and run and do stuff. But when you're heavy, you're like, ah, oh, God, I, I don't have the energy. I don't want to. This is going to hurt my body. <laughs> you know? So I had it done 17 years ago by one of the originators of the surgery, Dr. Foby. And... Um, you know, I haven't looked back ever since. But what happened for me, though, was once you get it and you drop a ton of weight, the real work really begins. How do I keep it off? How do I stay healthy? How, I've gone through this major, massive surgery to lose the weight. What am I going to do now? Half or more of the people put it back on. Some people put on half of it, a third of it back. It just, I didn't want that to happen to me. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I take care of a lot of patients who have had bypass surgery, uh, gastric bypass. And in fact, you're right. Uh, half the people 
actually regain all their weight and most of them gain regain a significant amount of weight and that's how yeah. they end up in my office so uh so it is not you know some people i'm sure accused you well you took the easy way out you had gastric bypass Please. surgery but you're right uh, unless you change uh even something as drastic as gastric bypass isn't the cure-all that people think it is no and it's not easy it's a four four and a half hour surgery the recovery is a long time this is serious major surgery and how are you going to go through that and the recovery of that and then put the weight back on no not me i'm not it's not going to happen so i had to really change my lifestyle completely change it so that's what led me to where i am now because i had to make a serious life change so i say to people I had to actually divorce food and start over. That's a good way of looking. So, okay, so what did you stop eating and, and starting? Let's, what, let's talk about stopping. What, what did you stop? Stopped everything. Because after the gastric bypass surgery, you, you have to fast for a couple of weeks. You can have like, you know, broths or whatever, whatever. So it gave me a chance to reset, also to test what I was allergic to. So, because I got, am I gluten intolerant? Am I, you know, what, what, what's going on dairy? What, what is happening? So, I also did that test, found out some things that didn't really jive with my system, and I just started rebuilding one at a time. And as I say before this, I tried every diet. I was vegan for a long time. I was vegetarian for a long time. I was a pescatarian. I ate mostly this high carb, high meat diet. I mean, I tried all the diets. I tried pregnant women's urine. I tried, <laughs> you name it. I tried all of them. So I really had to really come up with my own thing that was gonna work for me. And I said, I gotta find something I can stick to. So I had to find a food education. So I went to a nutritionist. I really studied hard to really understand the effects on food in the body. And so were there mental blocks that you had to overcome as well? Yes, because I'm used to eating fried food. Listen, in the South, in Louisiana, if it ain't, if it ain't good tasting, it ain't good for you. <laughs> Somebody with a big belly and they say, boy, you must be living good right now. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, for having the big belly, you're living life to the highest. That's why in Mardi Gras, they call it Fat Tuesday. That's right. And so one of the things that we now know actually about gastric bypass, which is actually exciting, is that your gut microbiome actually changes almost immediately following gastric bypass surgery. And that, yes. that's actually one of the new exciting findings about that maybe this surgery isn't just all about, you know, stapling your stomach smaller or bypassing some of your intestines, maybe at the root of it, it's really changing your microbiome for the better. And part of the reason that I did it is a lot of people that have had type two diabetes or diabetes, it helped to almost reverse it where they wouldn't have to be insulin dependent and they could take oral medication. So it really changes everything. So I thought to myself, I'm not gonna do this and I have to go back and redo it again. Cause I know people have had it done again. Yep because they put more of the weight back on. So any people, give us kind of one trick that you learn kind of before and after. Obviously you learned that probably the Louisiana diet is not exactly the best <laughs> diet in the world. <laughs> it tastes good, but it's not good for you. It's drowned in butter and sugar and salt, but it's not good for you. <laughs> I did learn that. But it tastes hella good, I gotta tell you. Uh, I had to really divorce that and stop eating the way that I was eating when I was still down there. Of course, cut out all the sugar, most of the carbs. And really, um, one, one nutritionist said to me, which is something I still hold close to my heart, you gotta find what's gonna work for you. So there's no one size fits all. Some people can be vegetarian and live a great life. Some people can be vegan and live a great life. I needed, I call myself a flexitarian. I eat a little morsel of whatever I like whenever I want to eat it. 
but I'm not confined to one certain food groups because the boredom will cause you to say, I'm starving, I'm so starving I could eat a horse, and you will try to. So the triggers that led me to where I was, I started hearing in my brain <laughs> and trying to retrain myself. And then someone turned me on to a couple of years ago, something called a leaky gut with this guy named Dr. Gundry, this cool doctor. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is history. So I started applying that. I became a huge fan of this guy Gundry. Oh, we're going to have to have him on the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a smart guy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it is amazing. Um, so much we now know of our brain's behavior in seeking out certain foods is actually controlled by the microbes that live in our gut. And the idea that these you know, little one-cell creatures could you know, hijack your brain to give them what they want to eat is, you know, is so preposterous on the surface. But now, you know, with the microbiome project, we know that in fact, you know, bad bugs can hijack your brain, you, you, this intelligent brain to give them what they want. Send you messages you don't know where they came from. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. You know they're there, you're not making it up that, you know, you want to eat uh, four bowls of jambalaya and finish it off with two cheesecakes. <laughs> <laughs> not one, but two cheesecakes. Yeah, two, yeah. Hey, they don't call it Fat Tuesday for nothing, listen, I'm telling you. Yeah, I, and, and you know, it's, it's funny, I used to know uh, Chef Paul Prudhomme quite well. Yes, what a great chef, though. What a great chef. A great chef. And I used to, uh, I'll tell you a quick, quick story. Uh, I walked into K. Paul's one, one night, and he was in the back. He had just gotten over gallbladder surgery. Uh -huh. And he, you know, he was so huge that his wound didn't heal. And he, it actually was wide open. And he's sitting in the back on his, on his stool. And he says, hey, Doc, come here. I got to show you something. So I saunter on over. And he pulls up his chef apron and he says, look at this, it's healing good. And it's, you know, this is wide open incision from his gallbladder and going, Paul, how many times I tell you, you know, this is not working for you. And, yeah. uh, you know, sadly, you're right. He never overcame kind of the, the voices to keep feeding himself. Um, so good for you for, you know, overcoming those voices. And let me say something, doctor, you know, it is not easy. This is really difficult. It's really hard to retrain your eating habits, the ways that you grew up, the things that you still love. You know, you're out at parties, you're out at events, and I'm a very social person because I'm in a social business. So it's all I do is entertainment. So all the time. So it really, you have to really get a grip on where you're going. I'm so glad you brought that up as well because, um, I see a number of young people with uh, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes in their teenage years. And I'm, I'm taking care of a young Hispanic woman in the Palm Springs area, and I saw her a couple weeks ago. And she's been doing great, but we, I always find out, well, you know, catch up and how they're doing. And she said, I made a really big decision over the Christmas holidays, uh, and I want you to be proud of me. I said, what'd you do? She said, well, my, my whole family goes back to Mexico to visit you know, all the grandparents and the cousins. And she said, I didn't go. And I said, well, why not? She says, because I knew that you know, they would feed me the foods that have made me you know, diabetic and I wouldn't be able to resist it because they'd be forcing it on me. And she said, it was just easier for me to stay home because I would have fallen right, you know, down that rabbit hole again. And, yeah. you know, for a young woman, she's 15 years old, uh, to kind of have that knowledge, that knowledge is power. And so... It's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So you're right. Uh, you know, you're, you're constantly surrounded by these social pressures. And, yeah, and, and I mean, let's just talk about that for a second, too. Louisiana, when you go there, someone just said to me the other day, Oh, I'm going to New Orleans for the first time. Everybody tells me, forget my diet. Uh, <laughs> okay, 
this is starting to be a bad thing, man. Like, <laughs> I get it. You know, you're going to France. Forget the diet. You're going to, to Italy, the pasta. I get it. But don't quite forget the diet. Maybe just have the morsels of the things you like, you know, the small portions. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. You can, you know, you can sample things and not lose control. But so many people, particularly early on in the process, often, you know, one or two days of heading the wrong direction just opens the floodgates. And it's, you know, you actually can change the entire character of your gut microbiome in three days of bad eating. You can go from a great set of bugs to a bad set of bugs in three days. It's that fast. And as you and I both know, once those bad bugs, yeah, once those bad bugs get in you, man, they, they hijack your brain. They're having a party inside you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're breaking furniture and throwing things through the uh, windows. <laughs> the bug party, people, yeah. <laughs> All right, so these are great tips. You, through the years, have you figured out anything else about help maintaining a, you know, a normal weight? Well, I say the leaky gut, which led me to uh, the Unify Health Labs formula that we've come up with, because now I know it's something you've probably known all your life. That's why you're the great genius doctor. But everything starts in the gut. Every disease, everything, the gut is everything. So a healthy gut, probably healthy life. So tell us about this new venture, Unify Health Labs. What, what inspired you uh, to start this brand? You know, people would ask me all the time, dog, how are you keeping the weight off? What are you doing? What's happening? And, um, you know, I, I often say to them, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And everybody goes, well, what are you taking? Well, so I thought about that for a while, a couple of years. And I thought, you know, maybe I should create something that takes the guesswork out of what are you taking? Because the average person's house, Dr. Gundry, we should do this. You and I should make some house visits to people's houses just randomly, unannounced, and see the 40 bottles of vitamins <laughs> sitting on top of their counter. And, you know, you don't know how much prebiotic, probiotic, you don't know what to take. Uh, you don't know if I should take 18 trillion of this. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it just... I just think I wanted to take the guesswork out so people are not really overdoing it. Because I believe this all sort of thing is too much. Yeah. Well, you know, okay, I'm going to take you up on that. So you and I, we need to do a TV show where you and I knock on doors and go into people's houses <laughs> and go into their kitchens and open up the cabinets. And I've got something for it too. The doctor and the dog. The doctor <laughs> and the dog. Oh, I love it. We would have such fun. We, yeah. All right. All right. So uh, get your connections going. I'll, I'll do it with you, okay? Let's go, man. You're on. So what's next for you besides the doctor and, and dog? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, I'm just continuing working. I have a pretty big management practice. we got a couple TV shows that are in development now. Um, you know, and we're just, we got products out. We're doing our thing. We're just having fun. Out there, if you're wondering, Dr. Gundry and I are very young. Absolutely. You know, people talk about anti-aging. What people really should be focusing on is de-aging. And I, for one, not only believe it, I live it. And you just have to look at pictures of me from 10 years ago. Uh, I look exactly or if not better than I did 10 years ago. So you can de-age. Let me ask you a question. How did you do that then? What do you mean? I tell my gut bugs to keep me humming on all eight cylinders. And again, you know, Hippocrates, you know, the father of medicine, 2,500 years ago said all disease begins in the gut. I mean, right. you, you talk about a smart guy. Holy cow. Yeah. And he was absolutely right. And as I talked about in the longevity paradox, Aging begins and ends in the gut and begins and ends in leaky gut. And if you don't have a leaky gut and you have great bacteria and you practice things like time-restricted feeding, like 
an exercise program using, I like high intensity interval training as part of my exercise program, you can actually stimulate stem cells to replace all of your important organs, including your brain and your heart. And so we, you know, we hear about stem cell therapy. These stem cells are extracted from people's fat. So we have plenty of stem cells. We just have to turn them on, and that's the secret. So again, you can actually activate stem cells by intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. You can actually activate stem cells by taking vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is one of the best ways to activate stem cells there is. You can activate stem cells by high-intensity interval training or HIIT training. So those are just a few uh, quick recommendations. And if you follow my rules in the longevity paradox, you know, we say in our office that 150 is the new 100, so. Whoa, I love that. So uh, let's, let's go, you and, I, you and I will race to 150, what do you say? Let's race to 150, let's go. All right. I'm at 30 now, so let's go. Oh, okay, very good. Well, uh, I went to Tony Robbins' 60th birthday party last weekend, and uh, I challenged him that we're gonna race to 100, but because he is who he is and can do wonders, I've got a few years head start on him towards 100, so he has to catch me. I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we can do it. All right, so I gotta I got let you go. I know you're busy. You're gonna work on the doctor and the dog program as soon as we get off yes, the air. This is a big hit, I feel it, I feel it. So where, where can my listeners uh, find out all about you and all the great things you're doing? Uh, where do they find you? Uh, they can find me online at uh, Randy underscore Jackson, yo Randy underscore Jackson. Uh, they can also log into the Unify Health Labs website. Okay. That information, the dog and the doctor, the doctor and the dog. But either way, you, if you want top billing, that's okay, but uh, it, it, uh, it'll uh, be a great uh, show. And it, since you're going to produce it, I'll let you have top billing. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to wear a stethoscope as well. Oh, yeah, there you go. I'll never use it. I just want to wear it. <laughs> That's a, uh, I'll tell you what. Yeah, you, you send me some glasses, I'll send you a stethoscope. That'll be a deal. It's a deal. It's a deal. It's a deal. <laughs> All right. Now, before I let you go, we have an audience question uh, that we always get asked. So Roy Ludwig on YouTube asked, when and how do you take your many supplements during the day, especially when you're doing intermittent fasting? Uh, so actually, Randy, I'm going to turn that to you first. So any recommendations on when to take supplements? I usually do my intermittent fasting. I usually don't eat past eight at night. So I usually do the intermittent fasting and I usually have breakfast around 1030. So I have everything in the morning because if I don't do it, I'll forget it during the rest of the day. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. I, I take my supplements, I take some in the morning and some at night, and I've, I've just gotten into a habit of doing that. My wife would like to do it twice a day, but she almost always forgets the, the nighttime. And so I agree with you. What I tell my patients is, whatever regimen you devise to get them into you is the regimen that will work. And you know, my wife takes hers once a day like you do. I take mine twice a day. She's even younger and healthier than I am. Yeah, so that, that was a great question. And Randy, that's a great answer. So with that note, take your supplements, everybody. And we'll see you next week. And stay tuned for The Dog and the Doctor. Hello. <laughs> Coming to a TV show near you. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, brother. <laughs> Take care. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.